Welcome to Ruck Up Podcast. To all the essential workers out there during this epidemic, thanks for your help, thanks for your support, and thanks for staying strong. On today's episode, this is what we got. That was freaky. Um, you know, oh my God. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> that is... <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's uh, been creeping me out the whole time. I just haven't said anything. Uh, me too. I just didn't say anything. Either. Check out the show notes for all the information for our guests, and also call us in. Let us know your story so you can hear it on the air. Hey, folks! Welcome to Podfest 2020. Finally, here, uh, all these awesome people that you see on your screen have joined Podfest uh, Golf Club. And I Woo! even found us, we are streaming live. Yes. All right. So it is a case where we are streaming live. Uh, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to go around and we're going to have everybody introduce themselves, who they are, what podcast they belong to, or if they don't belong to a podcast, uh, what you're doing here. Uh, so you start out, Pat, up on the um, top left-hand corner. Will do. Uh, I'm Patrick. This is Frank. We're from the Elio Sideshow. Uh, we've been doing this podcast for a while now, trying to reach out. We're two law enforcement officers uh, trying to reach out to the community, give an understanding of you know what Elios do, why we do it, because we think some of the uh, misconceptions about us have been just you know they don't have an understanding of what law enforcement officers do. So we have inter- we do interviews. We go over. Uh, things we encounter and uh, you can reach us at uh, you know apple podcasts stitcher uh, anchor every everywhere you reach podcasts and we are the elio sideshow again i'm pat and this is frank awesome will tell us who you are the um obs guru I am uh, William Young, correctional officer, author, and advocate for the correctional profession, and host of the ever-so-famous Saturday Night Synopsis, a weekly podcast that I do on Facebook Live, and we talk about the correctional environment and the negative effects that working inside of the walls and the wire can have on your personal life. Those That, that invisible barrier that we try to keep everything at work, leave it at work. Uh, what happens when that doesn't work anymore? And so that's that's what we talk about. That's what I focus on. Uh, I bring guests on that are smarter than me, and we talk about it. And uh, and that's what my book to yeah yeah. That's why I had Nick on. <clears throat> Sometimes I gotta <laughs> lower the bar a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> before fired, that, before fired. that, I had uh, I, you know I have a licensed mental health practitioner, Nick. And then I got to go back up with somebody else. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, you should have had a grade. You should have had a grave digger on like before me. <laughs> you know, I used to do that. I used to pick up bodies and, and embalm them. That's but right. yeah, 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 I did. So the grave digger is always on. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us, Nick. This is this will be awesome. Good information for everybody uh, to kind of understand what all of us go through. And it's just not uh, it's just not one person, one branch of emergency services going through it. Yeah. Joel. Rock up. Rock up. I'm Joel Nest, uh, host of Rock Up Podcast, where we, I guess, cater to um, law enforcement, military, security professionals, and uh, outdoors enthusiasts. Um, Most of the people that I do talk to are veterans. Um, I do talk to other security professionals around the world, people that work in military theaters, such as I did. And I kind of what I'm going to bring is a little bit more of the security side of it and what we have to deal with as well, because um, and I'm not just talking about a guard at a mall. I'm talking about actually in combat security officers or security professionals, I should say. Um, so, uh, again, thank you, Nick, for bringing us on board. This is this is great. And it's good to have everybody's face and try to push through and, and get some more awareness to the topic that I don't think a lot of people actually definitely talk about. All right, Tom, you are up. Amazing backup. I'm uh, rolling solo today. My co-host is actually out working the streets right now and couldn't get the day off. So uh, uh, I'm Tom from the War Stories Official Podcast. My co-host, who's normally right here with me, is John, but uh, I'll fly solo today. Uh, We had another podcast that was just guys getting together to talk about guy stuff, and all of our friends were military, veteran, law enforcement, firefighter paramedic emt 
And we found that, you know, like we all do when we sit around, the stories just start rolling and flowing. And uh, a couple of the, like, we had like two or three listeners, <laughs> you know, to that podcast. And uh, one of them said, you guys should just do that. That was the most fascinating thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, and so we kind of retooled, switch gears and made it a round table for anybody who's in public service, public safety, veterans, cops. We all share the same experiences. You know, we always say, uh, you know, firefighters and cops may not be on the same team, but they're in, on the same side. Uh, so we're not on the same team, but we're all on the same side. And that was kind of the the genesis of getting us all together to share our experiences and raise awareness uh, to the loved ones and the family members who we don't talk about this stuff to. They can hear it in a safe environment where they don't have to look at us with that look of, you know, in the middle of the conversation. So yeah. that's kind of why we started. And and we, we get emails from people all the time saying, hey, I, I thought I was the only one that felt that way or thought that way. So I appreciate it. So that's kind of why we're here. And uh, we've had Nick on. It's been great. Um, we're just trying to raise awareness and kind of bridge that gap between the community that doesn't know what we do or has no friggin' clue. When they say thank you for your service, they don't know what the hell they're thanking you for. Yeah. So. Right. Well, my uh, my surprise guest, Ernie from Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, the HBO uh, documentary. Ernie, how are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. Um, I just took your thunder from you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I was a DJ at a skating rink when I was 15, so try to steal that. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Well, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's couples only <laughs> here at Skate Rink. Jazz out of Red Circle. Um, but I am, I am glad to be here. Uh, you know, everybody here is bringing a, a, a different uh, perspective. But again, at the end of the day, I think we're all talking about the same thing, and that's officer safety, officer wellness, and officer resiliency. Uh, I've been a law enforcement officer for 28 years. And I've been assigned to mental health for 12. And during that time, I've worked uh, six of our own uh, officer suicides. And there's nothing easy about it. So I think what we're trying to do is, you know, going out in the mental health field, it's a lot easier to help people in a mental health crisis because they're calling for a response where internally, you know, we're not getting that call. Uh, we're having to seek it out through other people coming and asking us to check on their coworkers. And it's a much more uh, much more difficult to break through to get to an officer, you know, to let them know that you're there to listen and to help uh, because nobody wants to admit they have a problem in law enforcement. So I'm hoping by the end of today, by the end of today, uh, we've, we've been able to meet some common ground and give officers that reassurance that there is help available. Awesome. Um, Ricardo, how are you, buddy? I'm doing very well. That's a radio voice, guys. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> Hey, puts all, all of us to shame. <laughs> oh, how's it? How's it going, everyone? Um, my name is Ricardo, and I am the host and creator of Within the Trenches, uh, true stories from the 911 dispatchers who live them. So I'm representing the other side of the radio. Um, I was a 911 dispatcher for 13 and a half years, and uh, the podcast really started as a it was a college project 10 years ago that I was doing for my graphic design uh, bachelor's and. Uh, Nobody knew anything about what all went on in dispatch. Like people would ask me all the time, you know, you guys are just, you just answer the phone, right? And you send mm -hmm. people out. Like, well, not exactly. Um, we might be focused, calm, cool, and collected, but in the back of our heads, we're right there with that caller that entire time. And a lot of that shit stays with us. So it was a, it was a chance to uh, educate the public as well as those out in the field in, in the same industry that we are in and to just really share all types of calls, all types of things. You know, when my grandmother passed away, I took that call. So that mm. sticks with me. And it was just sharing those stories. And uh, it continues to grow. Um, I've got two other shows, one called Open Mic Live, where uh, we share all the funny and outrageous shit that happens at 911, all the different calls mm. that come in, and then a dispatcher's roundtable. So there's a bunch of different things. And I'm very happy to be here and to talk about this. I'm also the uh, founder mm. of the I Am 91 movement, where we deep uh, dig deeper into um, what it's like to take a 911 phone call and be on that other side as uh, people are freaking out on their worst day. Well, and that was, uh, there's a reason why every single person has been selected to be on PodFest. Um, and it was important for 911. It was very important for Ernie because Ernie does an enormous amount of work um, on the mental health side. I've had him on the show. Um, phenomenal resources. Um, I think the most important thing 
we tried to get a representative from the fire department on here, but they were sleeping. So um, <laughs> they need their rest. They, they do. They they didn't get a lot of sleep because of all the fireworks. So uh, I wanted them to relax and rest today. So sleep tight, my little angels. Sleep tight. Well, my um, buddy's rolling code three to a hangnail in progress right now. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, what's funny is, is on 4th of July, I posted a video, a, a, a meme of them on there. And on Twitter, it just erupted like firemen came out of nowhere to like, just completely attack. I was like, take it easy, guys. Take it easy. All right. Take it easy. Um, but well, we definitely have that brother relationship. I can pick on him, but nobody else can. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the thing is, is with the current climate that we're in right now, even when firemen are hated, you know shit's fucked up. Yeah. Oh, right. I used <laughs> yeah, to always you know. say, if you need to know the difference between uh, being a fireman and being a police officer, when four firemen pull up to a restaurant in their big shiny red truck and sit down to eat with that single radio in the middle of the table and the old ladies coffee club comes walking in, they go, look at those heroes. This, Oh, I'm, I hope the meal doesn't get interrupted. That just a nice chance to have a cold, or a hot meal instead of cold. And then four cops are sitting there. Who the fuck is protecting the city? Yeah. <laughs> Must be nice. Must be nice. <laughs> but yeah, you. I mean, you can tell like when you see the fire department show up like in Atlanta or uh, in Minneapolis and they're getting motherfucked you know shit's really bad like that's i mean that's the current climate that we're in right now um, and it's 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 been a dark secret for firefighters for years i got a, a, one of our guests frequent guests is a retired firefighter who's now a nurse and when they would roll to the south end they had vests and they would uh, shoot at the ambulance and shoot at the fire truck they didn't care you were showing up with lights and a a, a, a uniform and a badge they didn't care that's terrible shooting at the truck yeah and i mean um you know, they experienced that with Chop Chaz. You know, they had uh, they had two people shot inside of Chop Chaz, um, and uh, they wouldn't let them in. They they wouldn't let the police or the or the paramedics go in there and treat them. Well, I and guess they, they told the paramedics they can come in, but they couldn't come in with the police and the paramedics. Yeah, went, that's not happening. That's right. not nope. Mm -mm. Yeah, community Seems angels safe first. That's right, community <laughs> angels. Um, but more importantly. Um, more importantly, what we wanted to do with this was um, we're seeing a lot of um, poor leadership out there right now within the profession. We're seeing a lot of um, chiefs of police or sheriffs cowtailing to politicians. And um, we're seeing a lot of infighting within the law enforcement community. And I think it was one week, a couple of weeks ago, we had three suicides in one week. And, um, you know, I, I racked my brains out and I was like, you know, what, what more can we do? I mean, there's, there's Ruck Up, there's the, the Leo Sideshow, there's War Stories, there's, you know, the 9-11 Chronicles, there's um, the Saturday Night Symposium. What more can we do to kind of get it out there, get the message out there? And what came to me was, is what if we got all of them together, blasted this out, the, the stigma, breaking the stigma, breaking the culture, and just blasting it out to all of these podcasts all at once. And you guys have a fan base. I have a fan base. Everybody's got a different fan base. And the best part about teaming up is, is morphing those fan bases together. Um, so that was where PodFest came from. And, um, you know, trying to organize these many people together at one point uh is uh it was a lot of fun it was it was a lot of fun and um we're using um facebook live and we're using a special program that thankfully is working so william will get the credit for it uh this is the program that he uses on the saturday nights and symposium which synopsis you synopsis. always mess up my <laughs> stuff ever i think you do it on purpose i do yeah this is terrible no hey listen nick i appreciate you bringing you're right i appreciate you bringing corrections in because you know you you told that story about the firefighters in the radio and then wondering why the cops aren't doing it well, corrections don't even come into that conversation. So if, you, if you're if you going somewhere and there's a booth and you're raising money for first responders, we're never part of that conversation. Yeah. Yet our suicide rate is higher or on par with police departments, 
military vets. I mean, the, the, the most recent numbers have PTSD and corrections at 34%. And for military personnel, it's about 20%. And that was a study done by Katerina Spineris for the Michigan Department of Corrections. But ours is so different because we don't have that one incident, right? We can't say, oh yeah, it was that time that I was stabbed in the neck and that's why I have PTSD. It's, it's 20 years of being threatened. It's 20 years of fights. It's 20 years of seeing people cut other people to pieces that, that really catch up with us after, after a while. And so I, I'm glad, uh, uh, Nick, that you, that you considered corrections and that you put us in this conversation because we don't, I mean, we're walking wounded through the halls, man. And, 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 and it's not even like, you know, I know that, that you talk about the struggles that police officers have, but we have no community support. Nobody gives a shit about corrections at all because nobody knows what we do. And, oh. and, and so, oh yeah, there you go. Hey, there you go. Security right. is even lower on that list. than corrections. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, and so our job satisfaction is, is super low. And then we feel even more isolated because they're, because there's nothing out there. And, and, uh, and so this is awesome, man. And, and, uh, and any information, any resources that we can put out is great. So I appreciate you uh, doing this, Nick, and, and taking the yeah. time, all you guys to be on. And, uh, that's where not the, that's where dispatch came from too. Um, my former agency, we lost a, uh, dispatcher to suicide and the reaction from some folks within the agency kind of took me by surprise because they were like, had to have been something personal in his life. And it wasn't, it was the day to day nonstop, you know, before we get the call out to the radio, they're getting the call screaming into the phone, help me, help me, help me. And they're not going out to help. So they're, they're tied to the phone trying to keep these people calm. And then once they hang up with you guys, um, you really don't get an update because I got to tell you, in the 20 years in law enforcement, I've never called up to dispatch and said, hey, who took that call? Hey, everything turned out OK or, hey, that person's dead or whatever. So you sit with that through your whole entire shift. What the fuck happened? Like, what what was the you know, I couldn't even imagine doing a 20 year career like that. Well, we had a, a I'm sorry. I was going to say on that, you know, I teach a dispatcher class. And what the brain does, the psyche does, is since they don't know the outcome on this, their mm-hmm. brain starts to fill it in. And when we don't know something, we usually think of the worst outcome. Yeah. You know, so I think that's dangerous. And I think that's very, very important. I'm glad that dispatch is in here uh, on this because I think you can attest to that, right? If you don't know, you're going to assume the worst until you hear differently or don't hear anything at all. And that's what we just have to go home and try to process yeah. yeah, the the imagination is way worse than what you all get to see there because I'm trying to piece all that shit together in order to type it through so that it can get out to everyone who's responding in the best way possible. The other part of it too, though, is that if there is, if no one is talking, uh, let me, let me uh, say that again. If there's a lot of shit going on in the background and I don't have direct contact with that person, there's more pieces to the puzzle because now I'm listening to every single thing in the background and typing it in what I hear at the same time, listening to radio uh, and the officers going out there asking questions. And I might yell out to them really fast. No, that's not happening. Or this is happening while still typing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I've also got EMS and everything going on all, all at the same time for that call. So um, excuse me, the imagination, yes, can be definitely worse. And then there's no closure when there is closure, which is rare then it's way better. I could drive home and be okay with it, even though it was there, but I was able to process it because I had those other pieces. Otherwise, man, that shit would fuck me up. Yeah. And then, and then the other thing is, is us as officers out there aren't the kindest to the dispatchers or some of us. <laughs> well, then you're uh, dumb. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, no, what I'm saying is, is when you're on your way to a hot call and there are questions that you want answered before you get there, you're taking your frustration out on, the dispatcher, but you don't mean to, you're just like, you know, tell them to come outside. What are they wearing? Like you're, you're in your head. You're like, I don't want to fucking shoot this person. So like, I need more info. Give me more info. And, um, which I agree with Tom, which is, is if you're a dickhead to the dispatchers all the time, you're a fucking idiot. Like, yeah. Bring them as many donuts as you can find. Yeah. Or something. Cause you're in so- rookies listening. <laughs> you're an idiot. 
<laughs> Don't kiss the watch commander's ass. Kiss the dispatcher's ass. Damn right. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting because I think there's a split, too, is depending on, uh, for example, my agency, our dispatch center was in the station. Same. So, you know, it's it's a little bit easier to have a personal relationship and stay connected to your dispatcher when you're in the same building. Uh, and then there's, you know, larger agencies where you have a regional dispatch center and they're just isolated. And how often do the boys in uniform actually go and make any connection with these people face to face, in person, stop in, hey, thanks, make, you know, coffee, whatever. It, it, they'd probably get a reprimand for doing it because they're like, Hey, what are you doing over there? It's, they're busy. Don't bother them. And nobody thought, Oh, Hey, maybe these people on the other end of the radio would actually like to shake hands and meet and hug and talk about the call they just went through with this other officer. One of our guests got shot four times point blank with the 357, and the dispatcher was a friend of his and she was behind the mic listening to him call out, you know, 1199 officer down, I'm hit. And she ended up not being a dispatcher anymore. She just, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, I would venture to say in a lot of agencies, uh, a lot of officers don't can't even put a face with a name with their dispatchers. We started yeah. doing dinners after a while, bringing different shifts in so that we could do kind smart. of great things. That's very Once smart. Twice a month, we would do uh, dinners and sometimes on the holidays and Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. Bust out a bunch of wings and bring people in so that we could just meet them. I had an officer that I worked with for two or three years only knew him by voice. Uh, and then he finally came up one day and he goes, are you Ricardo? I was like, yeah. And then, you know, he said his name. I said, no shit. <laughs> said, All this time you're finally here. He's like, well, I was dropping one off. I thought I'd stop in and just see who was here. I was like, all right, well, here we are. <laughs> exactly. The best is when well, you, do you guys to- do like a ride alongs or anything with the, with, like, I know for, with our agency, we bring, the, because we don't have, we have a regional dispatch center. So, we have to bring in the dispatchers to ride along with the officers or sometimes, uh, especially during like training during our FTO program, we send the officers out there to sit for hours or a whole day just so they can understand like what, <laughs> what the dispatchers are doing. Mark, yeah. yeah. And then we forget it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you yeah. sit with them one time and go, got it. I don't want that job. I'm going back out on the street. Yeah. 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 My favorite is when you go up to dispatch and then you get introduced to the dispatchers for the first time and they're like, oh, you're Nick. And you're like, fuck. <laughs> well, so, you know, it's interesting because um, we are we were actually in negotiations with a couple of dispatchers to come on and tell stories of what it's like to work a critical incident from behind the mic and stuff like that. But the thing I think we're touching on, what Ricardo had mentioned, is the follow up, the, the, the closure Yes. The, the, the finding out what happened after. And, you know, that's something we've been talking about on our show for, for uh, a long time, which is, you know, ER nurses, if you walk up to them, you know, HIPAA, eh, you got to be careful. But a lot of times you scoop somebody up, you take them to the hospital, you can look at them and go, hey, I came in earlier with so-and-so and they'll give you the, it's fine. Or they'll give you the, it's not fine, mm-hmm. you know. Does that make it back to dispatch? Did you, you know, they took the 911 call. They might be interested in that information as well. We just need to be better at not only following up ourselves and getting a little closure on, you know, did that guy make it or not, but then passing that information on to the re- up, right up the chain. Yeah. I also think that dispatchers need to be a part of any debriefing from a critical incident. Whoever the dispatcher was that took the call, whoever the dispatcher was that dispatched the call, should be part of all critical debriefing. Um, they can do without two people for half an hour, 45 minutes yeah. for a debriefing. Because in all honesty, you can't really have a debriefing without them because no. they start the story. The story doesn't start when the first officer gets on scene. It starts when that 911 call comes in. And I think too many times our 911 dispatchers kind of get cut out of that where they're, they're, they're not part of the critical debrief. Um, so it, if you're listening to this and you're a decision maker, you know, that's a good idea. So. Uh, can I chirp in for a second? I've had three show, dispatchers that have, uh, come on my show and, uh, one thing and Ricardo, I, I don't know, you, you know, this better than I do, but one thing they said is, or we talked a lot about was everything's auditory, right? Mm-hmm. You have no visual of anything that ever happens. So your brain is working, uh, 
thousand times in overdrive to put all these pieces together. And I also brought up to the point of the the new dispatch systems. Uh, ours in Canada is coming up pretty lo- pretty quick though, where you can text or you get pictures or or whatever else comes into. The- hmm. And I asked them. I said, would that help? Would that help at least pick, put a little bit of the pieces together so that you have something? Some of them said no. Some of them said yes. So it really depends on the type of person that's working the dispatch call center. But the thing is, is when you're only using one sense to 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 put all these pieces together, you're not going to be able to make heads or tails of it anyway. It's yeah. going to be so hard for you as a person to overcome anything. I think even if afterwards they came in and briefed you on it, your head was already racing for the last 45 minutes. Is that is that briefing going to help? Probably. Yeah, it'll maybe it'll give you some closure. But is there something else that can help during the process of the actual dispatch event? And I think that that's something that also needs to be worked on from my side, from the people that I've talked to. Hmm. Yeah, I think eventually we're going to get to the point where body cams, where they're going to be live feed too. So, I mean, dispatchers will be able to actually watch officers arriving on scene and be able to dispatch more Some units or more zero reasons. dark 30 dispatching. You like that? <laughs> Yeah. Well, in the current climate, you're lucky if out of carry vests and guns. I'm I'm hearing that we're going to be replacing guns with stuffed animals. No. Okay. Or stuffed animals with guns in them. That's it. No <laughs> guns at all. Well, so you guys, we had a clinical psychologist on our show talking about PTSD and to kind of bring it back to what we were talking about initially, which is officer suicides. But, you know, we talk about dispatch suicide, correctional suicide. I think it all comes down to the same thing that our, our clinical psychologist said, that he's a specialist in cognitive behavioral therapy and treating PTSD. We all think of trauma, big T, you know, uh, the OIS, you know, the, the, the active shooter, the, the, the massive fire at a nursery or, or the, you know, the huge collision that kills three toddlers, you know, roll over on, on the middle of town. We all think about those like the big T trauma. And he said, you, you got to remember that there's the little T trauma. And those are the little ones that happen every day. It's the, the you know, little kid who accidentally, you know, hung himself with his bathrobe belt. Or it's the, you know, uh, these little moments that, in anybody else's life, that's going to be the worst thing they've ever seen. And for us, it's Tuesday. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And when those little T's build up, we forget as human beings that it wasn't one big event that caused us to to have these feelings. It's the accumulation of all these little tiny traumas. And so then you feel like a big giant wuss because why well, I'm having a problem, you know, well, no, you're dealing with these little traumas every day and they just build up. They got to go somewhere. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the thing to, to remember is that all of us have a different threshold for what we can handle. And so when, you know, when I picked, I've worked at the mortuary before the coroner's office, before I worked corrections and I watch guys blow their brains out for, you know, because they're going through a divorce. And then you look at some of our inmate population and they've lived through the craziest stuff for 50 years and they're super happy. So to, and, and that's one of the problems that we run into to in corrections like you said you know since we're all big tough guys and girls all the time right we're, we we kind of minimize what other people are having an issue with because we're either pretending that it doesn't bother us or because it actually doesn't bother us so because i've seen so many you know because i've actually held like a human head in my hands when i have a guy hanging it, it's not the worst thing that i've ever seen and, and so sometimes i forget that this newer officer here who's never ever seen a hanging before this is the worst thing he's ever seen. And so I have to kind of be mindful of that and check up on him. And, and just because I'm okay, doesn't mean that he's okay. And, and so you're right. I mean, it, you're right about the, the, the big events and the little events, but for some people, I think it's important to understand that those little T's for, for me may be, it may push somebody else over the edge. And, and I think that's why we need to, it's really important not to minimize and we say a lot of stupid shit when people are struggling and going through stuff. I mean, we part of it's our dark humor to deflect it. I mean, I get it. It's a survival mechanism. But a lot of it is, I think, just being dismissive because, number one, we're dealing with our own crap that we that we don't want to even deal with. And, and so we don't have time to to, to mess with them. And, and you know, we got to put on this facade that we're these big, you know, oh, nothing bothers me and blah, blah, blah. Uh, when when the reality is, I mean, we're all we're all on the edge all the time. You know, so I, I, you're right. That's a great point. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, more than ever, I think leadership as a whole in law enforcement, corrections, dispatch, security, all that, I think what's going to come out of this current climate is, is better training for uh, commanders and leadership to deal with PTSD, mental health issues. Um, you know, Ernie and I have talked about like PTSD screening. What what would that look like for law enforcement officers or dispatchers or corrections officers? And a lot of times, the reason why they don't want to do it is is that they don't they're afraid of what the results would be. Right. And we're all I think we could all agree that recruiting right now in our profession is not good. It's not nobody's beaten down the door anymore. I remember taking the NYPD exam and going to John Jay College, and there were 5,000 people taking the exam. I remember my agency here in Virginia when I took the exam, there were 1,000 people that took it. Consistently for the last five years, three or four people would show up and take the exam, and out of the three or four, one would have an open warrant. So, I mean, this is, this is, this is what we're – this is what we got. I mean, and the other thing is, is that we're hiring younger and younger and younger to the point where we're going to start recruiting in baby nurseries um, because their records are clean. They have no interactions with the public. They've never been in a fight before. They've never had an interaction with the alternate race. And that's a recipe for disaster. I don't want a 23, 24 year old that's never been in a fight. That's oh, ironic crazy. that you mentioned that because today we have an episode that we recorded last week and it's coming out today. Um, we discussed, we started it off with the carotid and then it ended up a discussion about how law enforcement in general and the public need to sit down and have a conversation about what kind of cop do you want in the first place? Mm -hmm. And then uh, we need to then decide how we're going to recruit for that. Um, because right now, I mean, I, I raised the question and it was dead silence. I said, I'm retired. I'll ask how many cops do you know had to lie during the background? Mm -hmm. And they, once they get hired, they're like, Oh yeah, I totally lied about that because they have life experience and they had to lie about it to get the job yep. as opposed to saying, you know what, maybe we should understand that life experience is actually a benefit and not automatically DQ somebody because they did something as a teenager or whatever that actually shows that they've been there done that so we got to have an honest conversation with the public about what kind of cop do you want and what are you willing to deal with as far as would you rather have you know a 21 year old kid with zero life experience nothing no public interaction but he's got a squeaky clean record or would you rather have a guy who's 24 25 been there done that you know since he was 15 run around doing stupid stuff changed his own life cleaned himself up is now a responsible member of society and actually understands the community he's trying to police yeah and i think ernie you and i had this discussion when you were on my show which is, is what if the new what if the new generation of police officers look they're all 30 year olds and plus yeah i mean you got to look at life and lived experience um you know, this is the only profession where you can come out at 21 with a with a high school diploma, really no college in a lot of places, and and get, get on a department with with no experience of life at all. And then your first 10, 12 weeks, you're thrown into a field training uh, course. You know, once you graduate the academy, and you're seeing the worst crap you're ever going to see because those FTOs have to volunteer you to for experience to go out there and handle the most traumatic events. And what does that do to somebody that doesn't have that kind of experience? So I think what we talked about was, you know, what if some college or college was required? Now you've got some type of critical skill, a uh, critical thinking skill that you've used, whatever classes you've done, you've had to use critical thinking. Um, you know, military is, is excellent for lived in life experience, but raising the age, you know, to where you can show some lived in life experience you know, that you've dealt with trauma at some point in your life, you've processed it, hopefully, which that can be determined during recruiting. And then I think you're going to get a better quality officer, especially if you raise what you're paying these officers, you know, yeah. raise the standard for them to get in, but then raise the bar for the pay. Pay is huge. I mean, pay, pay is, is huge. huge. Pay is huge. Especially That's when we talk to, to cops all over the country and there is a gigantic disparity between Midwest cops, Southern cops and coastal cops. You know, I know a 
agency in California where they're the highest paid agency in California and they're a sleepy little college town. And then I talk to guys that are working, you know, right outside Atlanta and they've got to take a job managing an apartment complex and have a weekend security gig just to, to pay rent and get food. That's, you know, two and a half jobs when one of those jobs should be everything and all of it. it that's yeah. what should be your sole and, focus. And the other thing is if you're going to pay, if you're going to have a low, if you're going to have low uh, salary for law enforcement, you've got to cut them a tax break or you need to rope in benefits because I don't know how it is for you guys. But when I first started in law enforcement, I didn't pay for health benefits. They were free. And Not anymore. Yeah. And just before I left my agency, 10 percent of my my paycheck went to my health insurance and my pension my pension contribution kept on going up because there was a je- in je- the pension was in jeopardy of being lost. So well, add to that right to work states where you can get shot in the line of duty. And if you can't get back to work, sorry, we don't have to cover you. Yeah. Virginia, where I'm from is the same thing. And right to work state is you can be fired for any reason without justification. So, uh, and the same thing, uh, Joel, I want to touch on the security field. Um, now that I'm I'm in the job market and my skills transfer over to security, um, talking to a couple of fans like up in Ohio and Pennsylvania about the pay disparity between the Washington D.C. capital region and and up there, the pay it's disparity is it's terrible. Like I told he's in a, he applied for the same company that I applied for, which is a government contractor for the U.S. Marshals. And he's like, this is how much they're paying up there. And I was like, well, they're paying this down here. And it was like, it's like $18 an hour difference. It's yeah. And some actually, if you want to even go lower than that, some places don't even have regulations on security. So That's they crazy. can pay, they can literally pay under minimum wage for whatever they want. And the problem that we have is um, a lot of undercutting, obviously, which mm-hmm. causes a lot of companies to pay less. And then the whole industry just kind of collapses in on itself. But um, to kind of elaborate a little bit more and to tie everything kind of into security for a minute, um, I do want to talk about officers that come into security and after they've they've done their their stint in the police department. And we do um, if we want to go into the PST portion of it, security doesn't have we're, we're kind of the, the throwaway card, right? Like nobody really classifies us as anything where. We're never really on any statistics. Uh, we work hand in hand with the military overseas, but we don't come back with a flag over our caskets. Like it's always something that doesn't really matter, but we're always called upon when shit hits the fan, no different than a police officer. We're usually the first people to see things because we're the ones that called you guys. And some people forget that. Some people forget that the old woman that was dead inside the bathtub for two weeks, that was a security guard that found her. Right. It wasn't the they called the police officers or they called the EMT or dispatch. Right. And I think that um, it's unfortunate because um, we talk about the little T's and the big T's, but it's there's really not a lot of concern out there for the lower paid people on the spectrum. And they have the worst jobs. Not only are they not getting paid enough, like you're talking about with a lot, a lot of law enforcement officers, but security is the same boat. They're not getting paid enough to deal with half the crap that they deal with, mm-hmm. but they have to. And then if they don't do it, then who's going to do it, right? And there's a lot more security professionals than there are law enforcement. And the I shouldn't say professionals because <laughs> a lot of them aren't really professionals. But, but there is a, there's that, a huge, like, the, the, there's a huge spectrum for security, whereas police, you know, it's sheriff, police, stateies, feds. But, I mean, you got, you know, you're, you're, stop or I'll throw my keys at you guy who just rattles doors on a business all night yeah. versus executive protection. That's a huge spectrum of security that 100%. a lot of people don't consider. 100%. And we're, we're really not thrown into any de- demographic, especially when it comes to statistics, right? So we kind of, when, when somebody, when a ex, and this is where I'm tying into the law enforcement going into security, when we have a, a, a officer that used to work, well, okay ex-police officer that now works security and he does something that's related to his PTSD. They're like, oh, well, it was an officer. He was, you know, he went through a lot, but it has nothing to do with the five years of security that he just went through, right? It's always something that was back behind the, the curtain 
that that that, that matters. It wasn't the security, right? So I just want to make that clear that it's also security. There's also things that people that, like you said, rattle the keys, they could come up on a dead body too. And that could be the one right. big big T that threw them off, right? Yep. Or it could be the guy that was working in Afghanistan for five years watching fucking families get blown up every 20 minutes, right? So it totally depends on what's... Like it just, it, it's unfortunate that we don't get thrown into the mix as well. And I'm not saying it's not because police matter right now is very, very important, but it's just, sometimes we just have to remember that statistically we are somewhere on the board. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers. 100%. We, just, we, we all see the same crap. That's kind of what, what our, you know, what we figured out when we started our show was that all our stories are the same, even if they're not the same. You know, yeah. they all we, all, we all talk about, oh, I th- I thought I was the only one that thought that way or they I thought I was the only one that thought I thought I was the only one that laughed at those jokes, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it's and funny it may- that you say that, Tom, because I when you said that about getting email, I just got an email from a fan today that said the same thing. They were like, you know, I found your show and I thought I was the only one that that thought like that and that was being treated like that by my by my commanders. You're not everybody that's listening to this and everybody that listens to it on the repeat. You're not. Right. Everybody, uh, everybody that's on the Zoom has has uh, has felt that way or have been, you know, wronged in some way. It's just how you deal with it, and you know what resources are available to you to get you uh, get you the help that you need. Wanna, you brought, uh, oh, sorry. I want to no, add ahead. something to what he said it, when he when he talked about you know going from an officer to working, uh, you know, security or or going, uh, you know, in corrections. People always say, well, you know, that job didn't cause you to to commit suicide or, or anything like that. But but it it I'm not saying that that's the sole factor. You know, working security is not the sole factor. Being a dispatcher is not the sole factor. But the environments that we're submerged in all the time don't make our symptoms any better. So if I'm going through a divorce, if I if, if I have a terrible teenage son yeah. going to work doesn't help that I still have that constant stress and strain that I'm under at work. So even the guy that jingles the keys, every door that he opens, there could be something crazy behind that door. And so not knowing that is almost worse than knowing that, Hey, if you open this door, there's a dead body, you can prepare yourself. But but when I, when I do rounds at night and look into these dark rooms, especially after just finding a guy who hung himself not too long ago, every light I shine, I, I think there's going to be a body. And if I can't see somebody, where they at, where they at, where they at, you know, I mean that, that is wreaking havoc on our on our physical body, you know, our heart. We're hyper vigilant all the time. So, and and what I hate is we downplay that a little bit. We're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, I just did CPR on a guy in the shower, but you know, police have it a lot worse. Or you know, I'm not a firefighter, so you know, or or you know, this guy. But that's all bullshit because we're all. I mean, even even the the cooks that work you know, the cooking staff at our, at our jail still has to work in that environment. They still Mm. see people get their heads split open. They still see crazy stuff all the time. And so the environment that we work in complicates and adds to all of that stress. And that's why it doesn't matter. And I hate that shit when people say, Oh, you know, the guy, yeah, I put his gun in his mouth, but it's, you know, he hasn't been a police officer for 10 years. Well, you know, try seeing, you know, a a dead baby, just one, you know, I, I, I've seen several, but just try seeing one and see if you can ever get that out of your head ever. And so, yeah, 10 years later, when you're sitting on your porch because you stuffed it down because you, you were a tough guy your whole career. And guess what? That little baby shows up on your porch and you wonder about how you can get rid of it and you can't get rid of it and you can't talk to your buddies. I mean, that's, that's the kind of, that's the kind of shit that we're dealing with here that we're talking about. Right. Sorry, Nick. sorry. I got on a little soapbox there, buddy. Sorry. No, no, no. And, Tom, I think you can attest to this as well, which is is the true PTSD and the true um, decompressing is when you leave it, when you leave this profession. Um, Never was a nightmare guy. Like I could sleep like a rock. And um, 15 years, almost 20 years in law enforcement, the last three months I've been out of it, almost every single night, just nightmares just constant nightmares about what I saw, dead babies, homicides, you know, brains on the wall, the, the, the shit that we see 
that I just would just put in the back of my head and I would be like, I can't deal with that shit right now. I got to go to work today. And then you just right. deal with it and deal with it and deal with it. Once I realized that I was out of it, then that's the real PTSD that started. Then that, then that's the real, like, very, very short story. I had a tow truck driver, uh, got into an accident, flatbed tow truck. The car that he was uh, towing uh, went forward during the accident, crushed him. The uh, tow truck caught on fire. Before it caught fire, I told the guy I was going to get him out of there. I mean, there's no way of knowing I was going to get him out of there. He burned to death alive. Driving down the highway the other day and this flatbed tow truck on the highways there. Instant trigger. Like a yeah. Flop never sweat. bothered me before. Yep. Never bothered yep. me before for 15 years. Well, right. this happened 12 years ago, but I've seen a million of those flatbed trucks. Shit, my car has been on those flatbeds since then. But that one instance, because now I'm out of it. And when you look at Blue Help statistics and you look at the suicides and you look at the retirement, the retirees that commit suicide, those are the ones that I'm worried about. Those are the ones, the ones that are that are leaving this profession uh, with 15, 20 years on or even less, and we're not following up with them. Those are the ones that I'm really, really worried about. And we're at 80. Four, I think right now for suicides this year. Yeah. 228 last year. You look at those stats, a lot of them are retirees. And it's that, that decompression. And I think we always, you know, I started saying this right after I retired because I, they, I started to get unwound, you know, so mm-hmm. I had, I had someone helping me through the retirement process because it wasn't my decision. And uh, it, you never know how tightly wound you are until somebody starts to unwind you. Um, and then you realize, oh, crap, I've really been wrapped around the axle about some yeah. of this stuff. Yes. Um, but, you know, we talk about, like, not realizing it, not knowing it. That's where we got to be, you know, better at coming home and better at, you know, figuring out how to to just purge it and get it out and, and do all that stuff instead of trying to pretend it didn't bother you. Of course it bothered you. Why wouldn't it? Yeah. If, yeah. if it didn't bother you, then you have to be concerned. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll tell you, now that I'm out of the profession, I'm a big, big advocate for annual PTSD screening in our profession, annual, with no repercussions. Now, there's there's obviously several different caveats to that. I go into a PTSD screening, an annual PTSD screening, and I say the magic words. As an agency, I got I, I have to. I have to follow protocol they're, they're for the liability of the agency and the municipality that you work in, but you do it in a respectful way. You don't grab the guy's gun and badge and throw him in a loony bin and then ruin his career. But there has to be some sort of guarantees to break the stigma of some sort of honesty that they don't feel like there's going to be retribution by going in to talk to a clinical psychiatrist or psychologist for an annual PTSD screening. Um, that's just my, my thing. I, I think an annual PTSD screening is a must. Um, and I think, I, I think sure, people are worried about that stamp, to be honest with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the stick. That is exactly what blue help talks about, which is that stigma because what, what's the moment, bu- <clears throat> sorry, what's bullshit though, is, is it, it, we, if, if 30 for me, for in corrections, if, if 34, 40% of our inmates had a problem, we'd automatically do it help. We'd, we'd have reentry people in, we'd have therapists in, we'd have everybody in, but 34% of officers have diagnosable symptoms of PTSD. And, and there's still this sig- stigma that surrounds it. And we're just like, ah, we'll just throw these guys aside. We'll get new people in. And that's when it's, it's important for guys like us, everybody who's on here to, to say, Hey, look, look at me. I'm not, I'm not weak. I'm not a, I'm not a terrible officer or terrible dispatcher. You know, and and yeah, this shit does bother me. And the more people that do that, see, I, I I know a lot of it's got to come from the top, but I also think a lot of it has to do with frontline staff and guys who are role models, not necessarily supervisors, guys that are role models in their departments to come through and say, yeah, hey, I'm fucked up, and it's okay, and it's okay if you are too. So let's get these, let's figure this out, let's get these resources. And the more people that do that, then the more people that will talk about it. And now you. And it's a you're talking cultural shift, Nick, right? So it's going to mm-hmm. take it's going to take a long time. Yes. So the only way that it's going to happen 
is if more and more people start standing up and saying, yeah, you know what, it, this stuff does bother me. Maybe not to the extent it bothers you, but here, here, let's, let's do this. Yeah. And, 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 and William just summed up the exact reason why we're doing PodFest is because five years ago, none of this would have been discussed. None, these people that you see on your screen right now, and I know from personal experience, there's no way five years ago I would have talked about this. There's no fucking way. Because like like Joel said, it's the stigma. Um, the time when I was in my agency and I was taking medication and I was seeing a psychiatrist, I never said anything to anybody until the podcast came out in October. Ooh. And then and then yeah. then shit hit the fan. Like you know, if if you listen to our show and you know the backstory, the whole shit started in October. But that's not by coincidence. And that shit's got to stop because it's not just Nick that's experiencing it. There's there's a Nick in Colorado. There's a Nick in Texas. There's an there's a Nick everywhere that's going through that. And until somebody steps up and says as a chief and says, listen, this is a fucking problem. 228 suicides last year. And I think it was only 146 line of duty. So uh, let me let me present an alternative idea, because to me, instantly, when I think of mandatory annual PTSD screening, it's that mandatory word, right? No, it's the idea that uh, who's training me and uh, whose pocket are they in? Yes. And this is my annual trip to the doctor to find out if I have cancer, Mm -hmm. because if I have cancer, I'm out. Right. Yes. So I would I would argue that not even mandatory annual screening. I would just say, just like your uh, sidearm qualification that you have to do quarterly, Mm -hmm. it's not screening. It's just go in and get your oil checked with the doctor. She's not screening you at all. It's just like a a session, a treatment. You know, you go in, departments could say you have to go in once a month and spend an hour with California. See what happens? They fell off. Maybe they fell off. Everybody's going. <laughs> then nobody stands out as a weirdo. Well, you know, also nobody knows what anybody's talking about. You know what? William William spoke about resources, and if you look at the nat- national average of the size of the police department, it's about twelve officers. You know, here in Texas, mm-hmm. we have two hundred fifty eight counties. So where where is a department with four to five officers going to find a resource where right. they can do these screenings? Right. So it, there has to be other alternatives. Right. I think, you know, there has to be some good self-care that needs to be. Those are mandatory classes that have to be taught. Right. Teach the officer how to take care of themselves. Give them a roadmap. You know, teach them about gratitude. Teach them how important exercise and nutrition is. Right. Teach the importance of doing things for themselves in order to leave some of this trauma and stress, you know, out of the picture. that We're not always bringing it home. Because I hate yeah. that leave work at work and home at home. That's I can't bullshit. do that. I'm a human being. I can't right. just turn off my emotions, right? Yeah. So there has to be other. We have to think of the small nut in this, right? The small departments. Nut probably wasn't the right word. Uh, <laughs> I didn't but say it. There's small nuts and there's big nuts, man. But these these little ones out there, they're small departments that just don't have these resources that are dealing with some of the same type of calls. These fatalities on these highways are. They're grotesque. I mean, they're disgusting. Those are the worst calls I've ever handled. So we need to be able to cater to all facets of law enforcement and first responders. Well, you guys know who Randy Sutton is. He started Wounded Blue, which is like Wounded Warrior, but for cops, which is a huge resource, but it's only brand new. How many people, how many cops out there really know that they provide free peer counseling and support and it's anonymous and you can just call? We, We don't know. They don't know. So these small departments don't know of resources that are just now starting to be put in place. Yeah, and they change all the time. And Ricardo, what were you saying? Uh, For dispatch, uh, back in uh, 2016, so this whole thing that I've been doing, I've been doing it for 10 years. The podcast, I've been doing it for seven. In 2016, uh, a couple of the big uh, 911 organizations um, were trying to do this reclassification um, to get uh, dispatchers into the classification for. the protective services, because right now they're in the clerical service. So I saw that there wasn't a lot of traction that was coming up from that. So I decided to insert myself into that battle. <laughs> and what I did, though, was I started sharing stories in a different way. 
and I started sharing memes. The first story that I shared was uh, one of my own, and it says, I heard your last breath the night you flipped your four-wheeler, and then hashtagged it, I am 911. And I asked other dispatchers to do the same thing, just to raise awareness to what dispatchers do for this reclassification issue. However, it quickly turned into peer support, and oh. thousands and thousands actually around the world we're sharing these types of stories. And to go back a little bit, as you were talking about triggers, that same week that I did that, um, and, and it exploded. I mean, on Facebook, um, there was over 40 million shares and reactions and everything off of that album that's on the podcast page. And it was trending at number three on Twitter. So it really blew up. Like a bunch of people were sharing their stories, which was amazing. And people were saying they uh, they felt like, they weren't the only one, that they were not alone. Same thing as we've been talking here. Um, but that week, at the end of the week, I was watching Stranger Things, season one, when it had come out. So spoiler alert, if anyone hasn't watched it yet, <laughs> there, is, there is an episode there where the, uh, the sheriff is out with uh, Winona Ryder's character and doing CPR on her son. And he's saying uh, something like, come on, buddy, come on, buddy, or come on, guy, come on, kid, you know, you're going to make it. That call that I shared, that exact same thing happened. Oof. I was listening. I could not put the phone down because I wanted to hear, and hopefully the kid was going to be okay. But on the radio, I can hear the deputy running out there saying, I'm on scene, I'm running out there. The parents had set the phone down, and I was listening. And he was saying the same thing. Come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. And I had buried that until I saw that episode. And, oh, man, fucking lost it. Yeah. I thought, damn, I thought I hadn't even thought about that. <laughs> and I yeah. had been out of dispatch for a few years already. But um, same yeah. thing, you know, with dispatch, we've been sharing stories like crazy through the I am 911 movement. And it's it's helped a lot of people. I have traveled to different conferences and have dispatchers say those stories out loud. Some of them write them down and they send them and they give them to me and I read it out loud for them. We only do this for 30 minutes. It's a session that I call Imagine Listening. Your worst days are every day. But then the last 30 minutes, because uh, I don't want anybody to leave feeling shitty or anything, um, of course, feeling better that they've gotten the story out. But the last 30 minutes is open mic and we start telling all the funny ass shit. So we laugh it off because, you know, laughing is good humor. But yep. from the dispatch side, that's what we've been doing. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, but just sharing those stories has been amazing. Yeah, and I, I will say that I think with this police reform talk that's going on right now i think what needs to be discussed too is is incorporating law enforcement first responder dispatcher families into the conversations which is is they're there for the ride along but they're not getting the training for it um, so a lot of them are not prepared for the type of up and down that you're going to be experiencing in your early type of time of your career the end of your career and then after your career is over so preparing the family members too is huge. And that's got to start in the academy now. Like that's got to be talked about. Like uh, Ellen Kirchman's book, I Love a Cop. That should be mandatory reading for um, for first responder loved ones. Like it's a how-to. It's like the what to expect when expecting book when for pregnancy. It's exactly like that. But, um, and it needs to be discussed because they're the ones that are going to get uh, the loved one out of a dark, dark place. They're the ones that are with them after they get through a shitty shift. So um, just food for thought, you know, well, they need to hear, they need to hear that story that he just, Ricardo just told yeah. about stranger things. You know, same thing with me in a song that uh, some stupid pop song on the radio that has a little chirp in it. That sounds like my radio dying. I mean, they need to, nobody in the Academy will understand necessarily what we're talking about, mm -hmm. but it's important just like self-defense training that you say, Hey, Look at it. at some point during your life, you may be watching Netflix and it may trigger you and send you back to a dark place. I mean, we need that information going forward because it, and it starts in the academy with us, giving it to us. And then, yes, you're right. The spouses need to know so they know how to handle it. But I don't I don't think people understand how small these little tipping points can be uh, for them. Like you said, you're, you're just at home chilling, watching Stranger things. And now all of a sudden you're, you're back to the worst day, you know, one of your worst calls. I mean, it, it's, it's a very, very real thing. Yeah. yeah. When I was going through the retirement, we had, we, we had a brand new chief come in. So the, the poor guy inherited a, a bit of a shit storm, 
But uh, on my way out, he handed me a book. And uh, it was the nicest thing anybody ever gave me in my career as far as uh, dealing with trauma. It was it's a, it's a book called Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement. It's The cover's red and white. It's got a badge on it. Uh, it's uh, Kevin Gilmartin. Oh, see? <laughs> Great book. I swear to you, I, didn't, I read the book begrudgingly. <laughs> and God, about shameless pug about his own book. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Mentalhealthbarrier.com. But uh, I, got, I got two chapters into the book, and I went to my wife, and I said, you have to read this. And she goes, why? And I said, because the guy writing it was sitting in our house watching us when he was writing mm-hmm. this book. I, I don't. And so it was, it's very eye-opening that we, we – it's already known. It's, we, we know this stuff. We've known this stuff. People have written books about it what we're not doing is we're not talking about it. We're still like hiding it as a, as a, you know, the, the retarded cousin up in the attic that you, nobody wants to talk about. It yeah. just, we gotta, you gotta air it out, man. Just say it saying it makes it real, but it's real. Yeah. And I think the more podcasts that do stuff like this and the more that we get together and talk about it, the, the, the better. I mean, there's more and more books that are coming out with discussing that, um, discussing the stigma, discuss, discussing suicide, law enforcement suicide. I'd like to believe that we're getting to a point where it's no longer taboo conversation. I'd like to believe that. Um, we were doing so, so well this year with um, with the suicides. And I guess a lot of that was with COVID. Uh, but, you know, I just I just foresee with all the anti-cop and I mean, we've, we've been through it. If you've been in the profession for over 10 years, you've been through it with Ferguson and Baltimore and New York and all these other things. The pendulum swings, but I've never, ever seen it like, like this. I mean, oh, Ernie, it damn near you, broke off. Yeah. I mean, Ernie, you're in longer than I have. I mean, have you seen it to this level? No. And you know, what's scary is a lot of officers are getting out now. They're leaving yeah. early. Um, not necessarily before retirement age, but what are we doing to prepare them for retirement? You know, I think that's, you know, uh, I think Tom can speak on this, but are we preparing officers? Because so many officers that get ready to leave, you know, I hear, well, once I leave, well, who am I? That's my identity. That that cannot be your identity. That cannot be. So I I would love to work with everybody on here, you know, putting together something, you know, a five-year exit plan that, that officers would follow. So as they retire, they find out who the hell they exactly are and they're not stuck to that identity. And we see some of those retiree suicides go down. I think that's important. You know, we can be, we can always do more and do better. Yeah. Well, I was always told to have your eyes on it. And, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to our Academy coordinator, Greg Dossie, uh, who said, uh, you got to have a condo in Redondo and it called it his condo in Redondo speech. And it was just his speech about, having something having an end point his was a condominium on the beach in redondo beach where he could walk out every morning and go surfing for the rest of his life after he retired and nothing was going to get in the way of that dream right so if you have that and then you remember that these are people that you're working with and once you're retired they're going to go back to working and forget about you so maintain friends outside of law enforcement outside of this profession have the people in your life that knew you before because i can't tell you how many times i would you know say something to some of my friends that knew me back in my stupid days and they go ah you're full of shit i remember you when you and i'm like yeah they keep you grounded and they remind you that you're a real person you are a police officer you're not the police there is no such thing as the police there are individual police officers and we forget that just as much as the public does. Yeah. Um, you know, we're talking sorry. about the uh, real quick. We're talking about the um, like what we do in retirement, and uh, it was funny. Uh, Pat and I just got done talking to Donna Brown. If you're not familiar with her book, uh, Behind and Beyond the Badge. Yep. Uh, she has two books out, and I know it was a real eye opener for me because uh, I took on that identity as a police officer, and I couldn't see myself doing anything other than that. And uh, in her books, she not only gives you and uh, ideas about how to think about your phase two in life, uh, which is in retirement, but she also says like, hey, if, you're, if you served for five years, if you served for eight years and it's not for you or it's time to get out, you know, these are some steps that you can do to, to get to you know, find your phase two. And it kind of gives you a little bit uh, easier time to uh, transition out of law enforcement and still have your own identity 
throughout that time. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, Tom and I can speak from experience. Like uh, when you were saying it, Tom, I was laughing because all of my friends were law enforcement friends and all from my agency. And then when I left, it was like, it's like, fuck. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I talked to like three of them now and it's all through text. It's just like, it sucks. You're just like, fuck. So now I just make friends with people at Walmart and Target yeah. <laughs> randomly. I'm, like, I'm that creepy guy with the face mask on. I was like, watermelons are looking good today, huh? <laughs> uh, avocados, three for a dollar, am I right? <laughs> That's me. But uh, listen, folks, I, I, th- I think this has been fantastic. We wanted to kind of keep it to an hour. Uh, we're going to go around one more time for some closing things. But before we do... I've got two things. Uh, one, uh, how long is it be- be- before Epstein's female pimp kills herself? Anyway. Oh, no, no, no. She die- she'll die of COVID-19. <laughs> oh, right, good, right, good. right. Fuck, I should have thought of that. <laughs> Shit. It's running rampant Fuck. in the prisons. I was going to say, there was something on Twitter already just a few days he's ago. He's on suicide, Raj. That, well, they had... They reported something in the UK that already said that she was gravely ill from COVID nineteen. Yeah, I don't know if it's real or not. It's the internet, you know. Here we go. But well, maybe Joel, know. maybe Joel can speak to it. I, I saw a meme that said they hired a private security specialist named uh, Hiluigi Clintonelli to <laughs> guard her. You know, as soon as that chick got locked up, you know, Bill was like on the phone. Jesus, here we go again. <laughs> I need your help. I need you to get him. That was that's pretty good impersonation. Like that one? Yeah, that was good. <laughs> okay, so you're, we all are gonna die now though. I mean they're gonna you're gonna end up dead. So yeah. the I'm over so under Hillary. I'm so scared. Yeah. I don't know how to get out. Um, so that was the first thing. The <laughs> second thing is, is I want to give some resources, which is uh, to text blue, uh, blue to seven four one seven four one. There's always 866-COP-2-COP, which is a 24-hour peer support. There's 855-964-2583, which is blue line support, which is 24-hour peer support. Um, There is firsthelp.net, which is a resource database for first responders. There's 1-800-COP-LINE, which is a 24-7 law enforcement hotline. There's 1-800-273-TALK. Uh, which is Suicide Prevention Hotline. And then there is 1-800-273-8255, then press 1, which is the Veteran Crisis Hotline. Uh, These are all available on bluehelp.org, and you can go on uh, their website and uh, get all of these resources. So we'll start with Pat and Frank, and we'll work our way around. Some closing um, thoughts? Yeah, sure. Uh, The one thing I was thinking about when we're doing this is we're doing this zoom meeting and possibly the only thing that COVID has presented with us is this idea of virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we talk about trying to come out of that, reaching out to your doctor. I mean, I personally just had my checkup done online. So, you know, talking that peer to peer to support, it's so much easier now that we've come here, we're doing the zoom meetings. You know, I know most doctor's offices are doing zoom meetings. It's, we have that ability to communicate, not just, you know, audibly, but audibly and visually. And I think that helps people in this new era. That may be the only advantage that COVID has presented yeah. to us in the last few months. I just wish I would have invested in Zoom before COVID. Yeah, definitely. And Purell. Uh, and KY. <laughs> <laughs> no one else? Okay. I'm sorry. Just me with KY. William? <laughs> Uh, top, that, top that top that ky um i don't i don't have any here sorry uh no here's the thing if 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 you don't take anything else away from this um taking care of yourself is the main thing and taking care of the people that you have uh, kind of sworn an oath to protect and part of that is any information you can find on your own because if you're waiting for administration to come up with some magic system, it's not going to happen. You need to go out and get information, learn about suicide intervention, learn about what mental health actually looks like, you know, do whatever you can do, uh, crisis intervention training, all that stuff, all that stuff that we say, well, we're doing this to deal with inmates or we're to do with the public. 
you can use that to on your on your partner to say, hey, you're not doing so good. Hey, can we talk about this? Because you're the first person that's going to see that in, that change in them and and reach out and 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 then get them the help that they need. You don't have to have all the answers. You have to just be there to catch them when they start to fall, and then you can shovel them off to any one of these other places. But you need to be prepared to handle that. So if you say, Hey, are you okay? You need to be able to be responsive uh, to that. And so if, if nothing else, if you're, if you're waiting for somebody else to tell you what to do, go out, learn as much as you can about those things. So you're prepared to help your, uh, your partners when they, when they struggle, cause they will, they will struggle. Joel. Oh, sorry. I, loud house here. I got four kids running around upstairs. No, no, it's all right. for a minute. Sounds uh, like the roll call room. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I guess kind of the thing that I want to kind of say is, um, everybody reacts differently to every situation that they've ever had, obviously. And for some of us, there are some people that I talk to that, um, we feel that if you kind of get that, and it's going to make me sound really horrible, but I'm going to say it anyway, if you have that kind of uncaring nature sometimes, and you worry about just yourself, then that also does help people have to realize that they don't have to worry and try to fix everybody fix yourself first and the analogy that i always use and i've used this fuck i remember my mentor feels like eons ago told me this but imagine yourself an airplane when they teach you to put down the mask and put the mask on they don't tell you to put on the kids first or the fucking person in front of you they say put it on yourself first and worry about yourself and then help others that's the only way you're going to get get around it and I find too many people are just out there to really try to help everybody all at once. You're not going to do that. That's not, that's not possible. You sound like oh. my therapist. Oh, you got, my, you got my phone call then. <laughs> <laughs> Only difference is I have all my clothes on. <laughs> yeah, you screwed up. You said he sounded like your therapist. You're about to get a bill. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> And uh, the other one, uh, no, and that's just kind of, uh, I just wanted to leave with that and just kind of let everybody know that, you know, it, your voice does matter. And I think that this stuff like this is very important and everybody has a voice and everybody has a story. So it is important. Thanks, Joel. Tom, you're up. Uh, oh, geez. Uh, what's it say? Uh, well, we always talk about, and my FTOs used to hammer into me and I used to hammer into my trainees. You, you can't help anybody if you don't get to the call safely right yeah. so it was always about driving code three but doing it responsibly because if you don't get there you can't help anybody don't crash and kill yourself on the way to a call well we need to i think expand that idea and start including you can't help anybody if you don't make it to your next shift yeah. so live outside of work like you're going to prepare yourself and do the things necessary to keep yourself sane, to keep yourself healthy and to get to your next shift. Because guess what? That's one more shift towards retirement, towards that condo in Redondo. Um, so, you know, if you're not like, I, I have no problems being, you know, selfish and taking care of me, <laughs> uh, but you have to be willing to admit there's something to take care of. And a lot of us don't want to say, you know, we don't want to be the weak sister. We don't want to be the potato chip. We don't want to be, the, the, the alien. And so we don't, we don't give voice to these things that, you know, we all have the cop nightmare, the, the, the PTSD, the, the, the flop sweat when, you know, phone rings at two o'clock in the morning, all that stuff. So if we don't admit to each other that that at least exists, then we're never going to be able to figure out how to mitigate it. Yep. All right, Ernie, you are up, bud. Yeah. So as, as the one person on here that doesn't have a podcast, I will say that I will say that it's because of podcasts like this. It helped me, right? Um, I was able to share a personal story on another podcast, and uh, very personal. And what I found was is very therapeutic talking about it. I didn't share that story with anybody else other than my wife. So when we have conversations like this, and we're talking about self care and taking a step back and and really looking at ourselves, self examination, we need to redefine what masculinity is, right? We can't we can't always want to be this this big, tough guy, as, as mentors, as leaders in your community, which I'm sure each and every one of you are, let's redefine what masculinity is. Let's, let's open up this conversation because I know for a fact, after I shared my story and I went back and listened to it, that part over and over and over again, it got so much easier for me. So, you know, for those that are watching this, 
you know, take that step, take that leap of faith, share with somebody something that you're going through and watch how uh, things just improve for you. Cool. And I agree with you, Ernie, but it's, it's extremely therapeutic. I mean, just having a podcast every week, like even listening to the podcast, listen to all of your podcasts, it's very, very therapeutic. So I have to agree with you. Ricardo? Yeah, you're just, up. Uh, uh, jumping on that, uh, adding a little more to it, you know, I myself for a long time, I was one of those dispatchers who buried my calls. I didn't talk about them and uh, learned the hard way coming home and not really sharing or sometimes trying to, um, you know, kind of turn into an asshole. <laughs> and and it was hurting people at it was hurting my family at home because I didn't know how to get it out. Mm. So it was therapeutic for me as well to it, it, it all started with the blog and then to the podcast. And I thought, you know, if if me sharing my own stories for others to hear, to learn from and uh, uh, go forward with, you know, if it helped me, maybe it would help them. And then bringing other dispatchers on to share all of their stories, it just continued to go and go and go. And, you know, the, just the same that everybody else has said, you know, the stories, they're powerful. That's the power of storytelling, man. It's It takes one story to change what everyone can think about the profession in whether it's law enforcement, dispatch, you know, fire, EMS, whichever, it just takes one story. And that's, that's what we're doing here. And we're healing from it. We're getting some sort of closure just here talking and laughing about shit too. That's a form of closure and healing all in itself. So this is good. I'm, I'm glad. Thank you very much for having me on here as well. Well, if I foresee, um, you know, we'll all talk offline with that. I'd like to see us do this again, maybe on a quarterly basis. Um, I'll know, have just, a partner with me. Yeah, without an arm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus, that was freaky. Um, you know, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> wow, that is. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, been creeping I, me out the whole time. I just haven't said anything. Uh, me too. I just didn't say anything on it. <laughs> but uh, I think I think because the way that the the world is changing so fast, I think maybe we'll do this on a quarterly basis. And we'll see what the fan response is, which looks like it's been very very good. Um, I will contact um, my buddy Carol Baskin and see if she thinks that this is a good idea if we do this quarterly. Um, you pulled that shit off. I cannot believe you did that. Yeah, Carol Baskin? Yes, man. Uh, wait, wait till you see the next one. Uh, oh, no. Oh, no OJ Simpson? <laughs> <laughs> He's top three, buddy. Top three. Him, him, let me tell you some side note. Him talking about Carol Baskin on his Twitter had me dying. OJ Simpson. Like, he's like, yeah, she killed her. She killed her. I should know. I should know. (laughs) Never leave the glove behind. (laughs) That good, William? Was that a good one, too? No, that was that one was terrible. It was. (laughs) was Your Bill Clinton was spot on, but that one was not. Not like my Christopher Walken. (laughs) Yeah, do that one. I love that one. Do you? Yeah, no, I'm not doing it. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> well, folks, uh, I hope that you enjoyed PodFest, and I hope you enjoyed um, all of the folks that are on here. Uh, every single person that is on PodFest, um, very dedicated podcast, really good podcast for you to be listening to. Um, so when one episode you listen to and you're waiting for another episode to come out, you have all of these other podcasts now for you to listen to. We all talk to each other offline. We are all very, very good friends. Uh, We are here for you. Um, Reach out if you need help. I gave you the resources that that are available. And if you forgot, just go on bluehealth.org. Go to them and do their resources. Everybody that's on here, I appreciate you coming on. This is fantastic. And- Yeah, thanks for setting it up, Nick. My pleasure, buddy. I'm just glad that it kicked off because I fully intended on throwing William under the bus if this was a failure. (laughs) At least you got my name right this time. Uh, It took about four months, but yeah. All right, folks. Well, uh, thank you for tuning in on a uh, Monday at one o'clock Eastern time. These people all have weird time zones. So um, take it easy and um, be kind to each other. Thank you for listening to the full episode of Ruck Up Podcast. We wish you all to be very safe out there in your line of duty. And if you have a story to tell and want to be on the show, please check us out on all the social media sites, our website at www.rockupmedia.com. 
and check us out on our show notes and any other way you can get a hold of us. Stay safe out there, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Peace out.